according to what? First of all, it's an honor to be able to say some words of Torah in uh, the memory of Benzi. Um, maybe with that beginning, with that thought in mind of the events that brought us to this, let's take a look at a subject, the subject, the subject of Hippo. Know that the theme of Purim is all hinges on an idea called hippo. Hippo means an inversion or a reversal or sometimes in English you call it a turnabout. What, what's the meaning of this idea? Let's see if we can try to think it through together. You know the whole center, the central idea of Purim is v'na'afoich. 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 It means that things were going in one direction and they, they reversed themselves. They reversed themselves into the opposite. What looked like events that were tragic for us turned out to be a blessing. Events that seemed to be spelling our destruction spelled not only our salvation, but a new a renaissance of Judaism in a way that was inconceivable before. The person who tried to exterminate Torah, Amalek, Haman, comes against Torah, in fact generated the acceptance of Torah in a whole new way. Generated the acceptance of Torah Shabal Peh, the oral law, which is really the whole point of what Torah is in the world. It's that part of Torah that we create ourselves. And every step that he took in one direction resulted in uh, in a movement in the other direction. That's called Hippoch. That's a major theme in Torah. Let's see if we can try to think it through and grasp some of the meaning of Purim that's based on this idea. First of all, you know it isn't only Purim, which is the Nafoich, right? Nach, the Novi tells us that in the end of time, the reversal, that means the, the revelation, the Gilui, of the truth in the world will happen exactly the same way. It won't just be that the truth will be rever- revealed. It'll be that the evil will reveal the truth in exactly this fashion. As Ehefeich al-Amim Safa Brura says, then Hashem says, I will reverse. I will turn all nations on their heads, so to speak. In other words, that the process of history has been going in one direction and the, 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 the method, the style, if you like, in which history will reveal its truth will be called as I will then turn around on nations. The nations will be turned. That means world history will go through a reversal or a turnaround that will show the, show the truth. What does this mean, this idea? Right? It's a very deep idea and very pervasive theme in Torah. Let's try to think through it. First of all, the reason that things have to be this way, let's try to, let's try to say that first maybe and then try to, try to think it through. The reason that things have to be this way is because, think about it for a moment, the alternative would be, what, what are the alternatives? Let's say you have a process that is evil, right? A process going against what Hashem wants. Instead of a world of peace and, and uh, mutual cooperation and, and love, you have a world of brutality and torture and evil, evil perpetrated in the world. The world, in case you hadn't noticed, is full of tragedy and evil and torment. What are the alternatives? One way one way is to get rid of that, get rid of it, push it aside, destroy it, and then you manifest the good. The problem with that is that you would then have something in creation which is unnecessary, or you have something in creation that in itself is not justified. In other words, you have a bad process, some damage in the world, and eventually you manage to overcome the damage, you push it aside, and that's all over. Now the good things, now the good times start. But it means that the evil in the world has not been justified. It means that all the evil, all the problems through history have been something that really shouldn't have been. Right? That means that there's a, there's a lack in the Hashem. The problem would be that there'd be a lack in Hashem's oneness. Hashem's oneness demands that all things are part of that oneness. There's nothing extraneous. Nothing, there's nothing in the deepest sense, nothing temporary that, will be, that can be pushed aside when, it comes to, when its purpose comes to an end. To get at one level. The alternative is that not that you push aside the bad, but you reveal that the bad has been good. You reveal that the worst experiences, given the circumstances that they occurred in, right, you reveal that, that those very things were the necessary things. Right? That's, that's what Hippoch means. Hippoch means that, right, Rav Tzodok explains that there are a number of potentialities, a number of ways you can, you can solve problems in the world. One he calls Achpaya. Achpaya means that you can, you can overcome the evil, you can squash it, you can, you can push down the problem. That's one way in the world. That's one 
But there's a much higher way of dealing with problems, and that's turning the problems into their solutions. What in English you call an elegant solution is not somehow getting through the difficulty and then an elegant solution is where you make when you're fighting someone you have an enemy there's two ways you can fight the enemy one is you can try to punch him down punch him down that's what boxing looks like more or less boxing you try to punch him into a pulp usually what happens is you break a few bones in your hand and yeah, if you're successful, you're successful. But it's a much more sophisticated way to treat the enemy. That's called judo. Judo, it's not a lecture on martial arts today, but a Japanese translation of judo means the gentle way. The gentle way. If you've ever been thrown by an expert in judo, you'll know it's not so gentle. But the skill is to use the opponent's strength against him. That's what you do. In, 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 a, in an unsophisticated fashion, you try to meet his strength head on, and you apply your strength against his. Right? And if you're stronger, then you win. A much more sophisticated way to battle an enemy is to use his strength against him. All you do is simply turn it in such a direction that he destroys himself. And, and therefore, it, when, when, you, when you use an opponent's strength in that way, you show that even his destructive strength turned out to be the solution. That means that even the, the enemy turned out to be the reason for his own downfall. And all that had to be done was that had to be shown. That had to be, that had to be used. And that's the secret of Hippoch. Hippoch means that Hashem conducts the world in such a way that in the end... In the end, and of course before the end, if you have the, the insight to see, if you have the eyes of Chazal, you have the eyes of the sages who can, who can tell the story of a Megillah and show how these events are unfolding even in the darkness of history. And don't forget the Megillah, you know, the, one of the unique things about the Megillah is that it brings about our redemption without really a redemption. What happens in the Megillah is the Jewish people are threatened with destruction, complete annihilation. I mean, if you picture what happened in Europe 70 years ago, this, that was nothing compared to this. Here you're talking about all Jews on earth being annihilated on one day. Now, that means, that means a complete, the reason Haman wanted to destroy them all on one day was because they had to be destroyed as a community. That means every one of them and the Jews as a community are the very idea of what we are. The concept of one day in Torah all, always means, Ein man that means that things that happen on one day are considered not to have taken time at all. That's one unit. And therefore, and of course, you know, anybody with any sense realized that the reason Esther asked for Taman's ten sons to be destroyed in one go, and we say it in one breath, is exactly the reversal of that. Why was it so important to her to have his ten sons destroyed, all hung on the same, at the same moment on the same tree, and we say it all in one breath? It's obviously, the whole, the whole Megillah is a hippoch, it's one thing against another. But there was a, destruction of, a decree of destruction against the Jewish people, and the idea was to have them wiped out on one day. And what happened was they were redeemed. But redemption, not in the conventional sense. The exile and redemption in the conventional <coughs> sense means that the exile ends and you go back to Israel. And you have autonomy and everything's fine. In this redemption, what happened was the Jews simply got back to where they were before. I mean, what are we really celebrating here? It's like a person with a disastrous illness and, and, and everyone's convinced he's not going to make it and he's got hours to live. And he goes for his final visit to the doctor. You know, he made all his preparations and the doctor says, I can't believe it, you're cured. How does that man walk home? He flies over the buildings and leaps over the trees. What's the big deal? What's the joy? You're just back to where you were. You didn't gain anything. No, but because he was about to die, he appreciates being alive. He didn't gain anything. It would have been better had he not gone through this altogether. The Jewish people simply got back to where they were. They were still slaves. They were still subjects of the Hashverish. The Jewish queen Esther never made it out of there. Her, her, the soiling and sullying of what she was as a woman and a great Jew, great Jewess, <laughs> remained. She didn't get out of there. She spent the rest of her life in there. It's a great, a great tragedy. She went through a tragedy that was unremitting. And by the way, I think a little bit more deeply, is that decree that the Persian Empire issued against the Jewish people of total annihilation has never been rescinded. That decree, that, that decree stands today. It was never taken back. Achashverosh issued a decree that said that all non-Jews on earth, or all 127 known countries at the time, all the 127 countries at the time should rise up and destroy all Jews on earth. And that was a royal edict. Okay? That's never been taken back. The Megillah says very clearly that royal edicts cannot be undone. And therefore that stands today, in case you, in case you hadn't noticed. You don't have to be much of an observer of political events to understand what Persia, the intentions, right? The inten you see very clearly that if you identify Persia accurately, you see very clearly that they're working on the same assumption. No question about that. Definitely working on the same, openly, not, not even trying to hide it. That decree is still in effect, and of course they trace themselves back to that, that illustrious forebear who issued that decree. There's no question about that. Only all that Jews managed to achieve was another decree that you can defend yourself. Thank you very much, you can defend yourself. But the original decree is still in effect. It still hangs over our heads. Right? Literally. 
And therefore, and therefore, this is a very strange redemption. It's a redemption that takes place where, where the forces ranged against us bring about a certain kind of a salvation, but not the usual sense of redemption. What they bring about is a trans, a trans, a trans, transmuting, if you like, of destruction of the Jewish people and what we represent in the world, namely Torah, into a, a new acceptance of Torah in the world in the darkness. Right? We remain in the darkness with a new possession. It needs understanding. But that's the genuine, that's the genuine reversal. And therefore the concept of hippo, the concept of reversal in the world, is that, is that something goes in one direction and then it's reversed in the opposite direction, meaning that the same force itself reveals the opposite of what it was revealing before and the problem becomes the solution. Right? And therefore, the Hashem's oneness is preserved. The Ramchal in Das Tunas and other places explains along these lines that this, this is, of course, evil needs to be destroyed. Of course, it needs to dissipate. And of course, it will show that it is only a bad smell that, that will manifest only a smoke, smoke screen in the world. But at a very deep level, and you find this in many, many ways. One way you find it is that in Kabbalistic sources, what's written always is that the dinim are sweetened. That's how they express The dinim, that means the harsh elements of world history, have to be sweetened. They have to be sweetened or they have to be... It's very interesting. Drinking, drinking, drinking wine is called sweetening. It's, uh, it's called... Bisun means it's a, it's a spicing and a sweetening. Right? You get sweet. When you, when you drink, I mean, some people don't get sweet, but those who, those, who should, those who should be drinking are the ones who do get sweetened. But here, what's, what's meant is that the harsh elements in the world, the bitter elements in the world, become sweetened. Again, it's the same concept. It's not, it's not that they get wiped away and something else replaces them. Right? It's always the concept is that the harshest things in the world, for example, I'll give you one example. One example is that the source of ultimate ecstasy in the next world is the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah. The lower self, that self that it, that is taken over, right? The self that that has hijacked us, that the lower self that that is the force of our destruction, the self-destructive elements in our personality, that turns out to be the pleasure of the world to come, right? This is another expression of hippoch. It means that that the the elements. It's not that the lower aspects of the personality need to be <coughs> removed. Once you remove those lower aspects of the personality, the good can shine through. That's not the, that's not the, that's not the work. The work is to take the lower aspects of the personality and make them shine with, with Kedusha, with sanctity. Part of the reason for drinking is that. Of course, it's very dangerous. Of course, it's dangerous. But that's the concept. You have to reveal that the lower aspects of the personality, they themselves were the reason for the tikkun. Right? You know, you see this. Odesta puts it like this. He says, that, he says that the original situation of man was the correct balance of two man, woman, the man, woman combination. The original combination was the right balance between two elements. The elements were the neshama, the spiritual inner being, and the, the outer bodily casing that appeals to the sensual and the fallen and the, 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 the material and the lecherous. And that was, that was, that was the opposite force. In, in, in the original creation of man, those two were in such perfect harmony that neither one, there was nothing, there was, neither of them could really be called bad. That means that the light and the vessel that held the light, or if you like, the soul and the body that contains that soul, both of them fulfilled the same role. The way, the way the Gemara puts it is that when Adam was created, he wore no clothes. He wore no clothes. The clo clothing was not necessary because clothing was not necessary because the body shone so clearly. The body showed so, so purely and so clearly the neshama that clothes were not necessary. When you looked at the body, you saw the neshama. Rabbi Desler puts it like this. He says, he says, if you want to understand what Adam looked like, he looked the opposite of the way we look now. Now when you look at a human being, you see only the body. If you look very carefully, you see a faint glow on the face that's called the ziva pani, but it's very hard to see. It's there a moment before death and not there a moment after death. It's very hard to see. When Adam was created, he looked exactly the opposite. When you looked at him, you could only see a neshama. If you looked very carefully, you could make out the wispy outlines of a body. Exactly the opposite. That's looking at a thousand watt electric globe. You look very carefully, you can see the glass. But re what, what you really see is the light. That, that's why I didn't need clothes. When a body shines like that, the Gemara puts it like this. The Gemara says, the Gemara in the Medrash says, that Adam was created wearing kosnos or. He wore garments of light, alaf vavresh. Garments of light. That means his, bodily he, his body was a garment that revealed. Light is a medium of revelation. When you wear light, it means that the outside shows the inside. When you've got an outside like that, you don't need, you don't need clothing. And then what happened was this, the eating from the fruit of the tree reversed that. And man became a creature who is only outside. And the inside is just as hard to see as the outside was before. Right? You know, you could put it like, Rav Desta puts it something like this. When you think of yourself now, now in the post-sin world, the post in the damaged world, the way we think of ourselves is Yetzirah. There's no question about it. The way we think of ourselves, I, 
you know, we, we like, like to think of ourselves as spiritual beings and religious beings, but it's not, it's not so. When, when, when Adam Mauritian said I, he meant only spirit. He meant only the part of his being that wanted to be close to Hashem. The second person, you, addressing him as, as temptation was a serpent standing at a distance. Would you like to sin? Speaking in the second person as a persona outside of him. After the sin, that's been reversed. Now the I is all yet to her. And the, and the conscience and the higher element speaks from a distance. It's very easy to show this. If you're facing something delicious that you'd like to taste, especially when you shouldn't, there's no question which inner voice speaks. Mm, I'd like to taste that. I'd like to taste that. And the conscience says, excuse me, you know you shouldn't. The conscience always speaks in the second person. That's very humiliating. But whenever you, whenever you, the sense of self that you have is called I. The conscience, if it speaks at all, speaks from a distance. We've been hijacked. Gemara puts it like this. The Gemara says that the, the, the Yetzirah is like a passerby in the street. Then he's like a beggar at the door. Then he's like a guest in your home. And then if you're lucky, you remain a guest. He's taken over, right? You know, the way the Gemara puts this is, Rav Moshe Shapiro once put it like this. He said, what's the right way to rob a bank? What's the right way to rob a bank? You walk in with a motorcycle helmet and a gun. It's a, that's not a sensible way to rob a bank. The right way to rob a bank is to make an appointment with a manager walk into his office, put a sock in his mouth, tie him up, lock him, lock him up in the cupboard, sit at his desk and run the bank. That's the sensible way to rob a bank. Anyone know any sense? That's, that's what the Yetzirah has done to us. He's taken over to the extent that when you say I, you really mean him. The real I is locked in a cupboard someplace going, mm -hmm. right? That, this is what Chazal called Tzfoni. It's a Tzfoni Archik Me'alechem. Hashem says in the final end of days, I will distance the Tzfoni from you. What does Tzafon mean? Tzafon means hidden. The Yetzirah is hidden. What's the best way to hide something? You don't put it someplace where you've got to go looking for it. You put it in full view. You dress it up as like, this is why we wear masks on Purim. The whole idea of a mask and unmasking on Purim is exactly this. We're reversing the reversal. That's what we're doing here. But what's happened is there's no greater mask, no greater hiding than dressing him up like you. He pretends to be you. So when you go around saying I, you don't mean the spiritual I that you think you mean. It's really... That means the very tool that you use to go searching for your pure self has been damaged. The tool you're using, the, even the desire you have to go find yourself is all yet Sahara. There's all a vested interest, right? Even the tools are damaged. The, and therefore, and that the complete reversal, of course, the solution was to wear clothing. The solution was to wear clothing. When the body falls into the enemy of the neshama, then you have to, and of course, what happened was man wore garments to hide his nakedness. What did he do? He took fig leaves. Why figs is interesting discussion, but that's not for now. But he took a fig leaf and tried to cover himself. And Hashem appeared in the garden and said, I'm going to teach you a fundamental lesson throughout history. Covering your nakedness like that is not correct. You have to now learn that the problem must always be made the solution. Clothes are the problem. I'm going to teach you now that you use clothes no longer to hide your nakedness, but to reveal your dignity. And Hashem sewed in beautiful garments of what's called Ayn Vavresh. The, the, again, the mistake is, man thought that you have a nakedness and a shame, you need to hide it. And Hashem comes to teach him that whenever you encounter a problem in the world, use its force against itself. Take clothing to hide your nakedness, but use them to reveal the dignity that should have been there. Right? And that's why the word levush in Hebrew, which means a garment, spells lo bosh, not to be ashamed. The levush is, is what counts as shame. Right? And of course, beged, the other word for a garment, it means exactly. Beged means treachery. In Hebrew, beged means, a boged is a traitor. Right? In old English, 18th century English, a traitor was called a turncoat. It was a turnaround of the coat. He was wearing the... And therefore, tr clothes, and of course, anyone who knows Hebrew knows that an outer garment expresses the same idea. A me'il is an outer garment. Me'il also means treachery. Me'ila means to take something sanctified and use it for the profane. It's an exact treachery of the, at the deepest level. And therefore, clothes need to become the solution. And therefore, we now wear this outer garment. And of course, on Purim, we, we, yeah, we play with that idea. On Purim, what we do is we, we, we betray the clothing too, of course. To turn them inside out. But that's the idea of reversal. Hippoch means that you now turn the problem into its solution. Now, some, some point out that first man was clothed in alav vavresh, garments of light. Hashem clothed him ayin vavresh. Yeah, there's a wonderful principle in Hebrew that when an alav becomes an ayin, it represents the change from spiritual to material. Alav vavresh means or light. Ayin vavresh means no light. Or, Ayin Vavresh in Hebrew spells Iver, blind. Aleph Vavresh means you can see. Ayin Vavresh, Iver, you can't see. That's why this is called a thick hide in English. In English, you call the skin a hide. What is it? Hide. It's Iver, it's a blindness, right? That's what it is. Before it was a reveal. And now the trick is to use the exterior to be the solution. Let's take another example. Take another example. 
when man crashed that situation of body and soul into, into a warring factions, what was the world's solution? The world's solution was to banish the body and exile it. You want to be spiritual, you become a celibate and ascetic, you sit on a mountaintop, you don't think of marriage, you don't drink wine, the last thing you do is drink wine. And the nations of the world always chose that path. The reason is because, because once the body becomes a problem, you have to control it. You have to control it. The body's fallen, the body's irredeemable, and therefore you have to become an ascetic, you have to become... And you think about the religions of the world, both, both West and East, you find this theme, very, very deep theme in non-Jewish spirituality. Christianity, for example. Christianity is fraught with guilt about marital intimacy and sensuality, fraught with guilt about that. If you're a Christian and you're serious about sanctity, you have become a monk or a nun. Because, because the body the body's hopeless. Once you start letting the body speak, there's no question it will bring you down. And of course, there's a truth in that. No question there's a truth in that. Not fools. Islam. Muslims are not allowed to own alcohol. Right? We, you see a very sharp difference between us. In Islam, they're not allowed to own alcohol. The first year I went to Israel, I had a very expensive, expensive bottle of whiskey. Just before Pesach. I don't want to sp- pour out the whiskey. So I went to Abu Ghosh. And I found an Arab on the street. And I said, look, do me a favor. Don't ask questions. Buy this bottle of whiskey from me. I knew he wasn't allowed to drink it. I'll come back in eight days. I'll buy it back from you. He said, I'd love to do that. We're not allowed to own alcohol. I can't help you. I had to go to a Christian moshav called Yad Hashmona, which tried to convert me to Christianity. I had to pour the whiskey out. I mean, they're not allowed to own alcohol. because, And some sects take it to even greater extremes. I mean, the Mormons, for example, a Christian sect called... I had a Mormon friend when I was 18. He was not allowed to drink coffee. Not allowed to drink coffee. He's got caffeine in it. Who knows what you might do if you drink a cup of coffee. He wasn't allowed to drink tea. They don't drink Coke. I mean Coca-Cola. No Coca-Cola, no tea, no coffee. Never, no, no, no alcohol. No stimulant. Because, because once you give voice, once you give expression to the stimulated lower being, no question what will, no telling what will happen. Right? In all countries in the world, certainly all Western countries, you can't buy a beer until you're 18 or some places 21. You can drive five tons of dangerous weapon down the street at 90 kilometers now, but you can't buy a beer. In Judaism, kids eight days old, we put wine in his mouth. I mean, we, 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 at every moment of connection between spiritual and physical, we take alcohol, we take wine. Let alone put it. Every time we're joining soul and body together, every time we take the body and lift it up into transcendence, two people getting married, potentially the most sordid expression of human relationship, we stand with a cup of wine. Shabbos, when the week transcends into the Kedusha of Shabbos, we take a cup of wine. Circumcision, Bris Miller, when we take the most fallen part of human materialism, and give it the ability to transcend, we take a cup of wine. Havdol is the same thing. Havdol, you're coming down from the Kedusha to make this week elevate itself to a higher Shabbos next week than was there before. We take wine. We see it so often in Judaism, we don't even think about it. Nichnas yain yatza sod. That means when the wine goes in, it reveals the secret world. What secret world? The secret of wine is that when you use it correctly, it lifts the body into oneness with the Neshama. Right? The non-Jewish pathway is completely the opposite. And that was the great new idea that Abraham brought to the world. Avram Avinu brought to the world the concept that their body now is to be elevated to the spiritual. And the world said to him, you're crazy. You let the body express itself, it will bring the soul down. And he said, but we have to reunite the world. We have to bring together, we have to use the problem for its solution now. You have to take the body that was the problem and make the body the vessel of Kedusha. How do you see this? It says in Shira Shirim, Acha Islanu Katana, right? Shira Shirim, that incredible song of love between the two partners in a love relationship, husband and wife, relating to each other deeply. So that oneness, that unification, that is called Shira Shirim, it says, Acha Islanu Katana, we have a young sister. Achotlanu, we have a young sister. Says the Medrash, who's our young sister? Avram Abinu, Abraham's wife. She iches akara, which means, the word ach, ach in Hebrew means to stitch together. La'acheh. In Hebrew, if you tear something and you restitch it, that's called la'ache. The word echad, the Maral says, means to stitch four together. The four corners of the world, to pull them together. Echad. Ach means to stitch together. Brothers are two people who are connected because they have a common source. Brother, brother, sister. Ach, echad. La'ache means to stitch together. He came upon a broken world, a torn world, where spirit lived in one domain and the physical lived in another domain. And his work was to stitch them together. How do you do that? You use the physical for the spiritual. And the world said to him, you're crazy. When you use the physical for the spiritual, bring the spiritual down. He said, so you mean we accept a torn world and we accept a lack of oneness in the world? They said, there's no other way. Adam damaged it. It's torn apart. It's torn asunder. You can no longer engage the physical. And he said, our work is to reach back into that garden where they were all one, where they were both one. And therefore, we have to engage this, the, the physical and make it spiritual. And therefore, he reached the, the whole process, the chidush that he brought to the world, was to stitch together a torn world. By the way, Avraham is Gematria Ramach. Same number as mitzvahs. 
as all the mitzvah actions you do in the world. Not Torah, mitzvah. Mitzvah means taking a physical action and making it spiritual. Virtually every mitzvah of all the mitzvahs is a physical action. It's not a meditational thing when you sit on a mountaintop and, and say prayers into the wind. That's not what it is. It's getting the body involved. And according to Hasid, it's the lower parts, the worst parts, the more fallen parts of the body and the human frame are capable of the greatest Kedusha. That's a, per- that's a weird idea. In the non-Jewish mind, that's a perverted idea. And in Judaism, that's Kedusha. Right? That is the idea. It's a reunification. <coughs> By the way, just as an aside, a beautiful aside, beautiful, amazing idea. When Avram and Sarah manifest that original oneness, Shira Shirim is this love between husband and wife. Where is that asserted most powerfully in Torah? When Avram and Sarah cross the border from the zone of Kedusha, Israel, into the zone of marital Tumor, Egypt, Egypt was the most depraved place on earth. As they cross the border, he turns to his wife and he says to her, please tell him you're my sister. Imri na achesi, please tell them that you're my sister. What's going on? The simple understanding is because if they think you're my wife, they'll kill me. If they know you must, if they think you're my sister, then they'll honor me. And... But the deep meaning is every husband should think of his wife as a sister, as his sister. Because what is brother and sister? There are two people who have a common origin in the parents and they remain separate but related. What are husband and wife? They're two people who had a common origin in the spiritual world. They were bonded and fused in the spiritual world, broken apart and brought down to this world to reunite. And therefore, that's the Kedusha of Jewish marriage. And as he moves from the zone of Kedusha in Israel into the zone of Tumor, which is called Egypt, where that is exactly perverted, he reasserts the connection with his wife as brother-sister relationship, meaning a reunification of the oneness. And that is the path through history that we take. We come into the world and we take the problem and make it the solution. That's a unification. The Yetzirah has to become the agency of the ecstasy in the next world. Right? The problems of this world, the Yetzirah has to be the vessel and the, 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 the reason. What marks you as holy as a Jew is not your meditations. As much as the way you drink your wine and eat your bread and, and, and evolve. Yeah? It's, the, it's expression in the body. By the way, the word mitzvah means a connection. The word mitzvah means a connection. Tzavta, the word, Hebrew word for command is tzivui. Mitzvah is a different word entirely. Mitzvah means to connect two things together. But savta chada means in one bond. In modern Hebrew, the word sevet means a crew, people who function together. Mitzvah means taking a spiritual instruction from Hashem and expressing it in the physicality of the world. It's a reunification. It's making the problem into the solution. Right? That is the manifestation, the, re, the, re, the shining of a oneness that was originally in the world is a rebuilding of that oneness. Let's take another example. Take another example. What's the Torah concept of justice? Justice. The deepest concept of justice in Torah is a reversal. A reversal. That's called nekama. Nekama. Let's study this for a moment. There are two ways. There are two ways to punish the evil. One is to hurt, to hurt the person. Do damage. Person to damage, you do damage to the person. In some way. That's called punishment. But the Torah's vision of punishment is not like that. The Torah's vision of punishment is that exactly what the person did is what must happen to him. That's called nekama. Not, let's understand this amazing idea din and justice is one thing person to damage they have to pay they have to pay to make amends they have to pay they have to suffer they have to be hurt there's a much deeper manifestation of justice and that is exactly what the person did is exactly what they must go through let's just understand first of all there's a, there's a forbidden method the forbidden manifestation of the common right that means when somebody hurts you this is what you're forbidden to do somebody harms you as a Jew you're forbidden to do to them what they did to you right? You're forbidden even to want to. That's called Nekama and Natira. The Chinuch lists both of them and gives the same reason for both of them, right? In Reish Mem and Reish Mem Aleph in the Chinuch, he explains what's the idea of Nekama and Natira, right? Nekama is when you do some... Yes, Nekama means you, you, do, you go to your neighbor and you say, can I please borrow your lawnmower? And he says, no. A week later, he comes over and says, can I please borrow yours? And you say, no. You didn't lend me yours, I'm not lending you mine. That's Nekama. You're forbidden to do that as a Jew. That's doing to him what he did to you. That's the worst use. That's the wrong use of this idea. Natira is where he can, you say, can, can I borrow your lawnmower? And he says, no. <coughs> Next week he comes over and says, can I borrow yours? And you say, sure, I'm not like you. That's called Natira. You're not, you're not doing it, but you're reminding him, right? That you're not allowed to do. And the Chinuch gives reason why you're not allowed to do this. That's called, that's called trying to bounce back against the person. What he, by the way, it's a very, very deep human motivation. When somebody harms you, there's a tremendous rich motivation to want to do to the person what he did to you. And a tremendous joy in seeing the person suffer exactly what he did to you. Right? Very, very powerful motivation. In the, in the English world, they say there's nothing sweeter revenge than re- revenge. Very, very sweet, right? Revenge. And we're not allowed to do that. But there's a correct version of Nakama. 
The correct version is when Hashem organizes things in the world in such a way that the evil fall into their own trap and they get destroyed by what they set up. That's called Nakama. Right? Kel Nakama is Hashem, we say. Hashem, the wrong, the wrong version of justice, the wrong, the wrong use of Nakama in the world is when you've got a personal animus against another person. He hurt you, you want to hurt him back. Right? That's completely inappropriate. But when it's an assertion of justice, it's the greatest mitzvah. And Hashem sets up justice in the world that way. For example, you notice that when the Torah stipulates the punishment for somebody who does something wrong, it always stipulates it exactly the same way. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand. We never do that. We never do. The Gemara has dozens of reasons, a whole long discussion in the Gemara, why an eye for an eye could never mean an eye for an eye. He gouges out an eye, says the Torah, you gouge out his eye. Ridiculous, says the Gemara, could never mean that. Brings endless proofs that it could not mean that. And it doesn't mean it. It means you pay money. But notice that the Torah expressed it that way. The Torah chose a problem, very problematic expression that might well lead you astray, that needs lots of proofs in the oral law that it could not mean that. But the Torah doesn't do that. The Torah says that a person... And what's being said here is something amazing. When a person harms somebody else, there's only one balancing that's possible in the world, that he goes through exactly what he went through. True, we can't do that. There are many reasons why we can't do it. Make the person pay. We use money as a substitute and as a... Many, many reasons why we can't do it. But notice that the Torah expresses it exactly as an eye for an eye. And it means exactly an eye for an eye. And only if the money amounts to an eye for an eye has justice been done. The reason is because you have to turn the prop. That means only the thing itself can correct the thing itself. Right? There's, there's, a, there's a perfect justice that has to be manifest in the world. This is a secret of Purim as well. Right? Why? Amazing thing. The Gemara says like this. The Gemara says that in Sanhedrin, the Gemara says, in Perik Chelek, the Gemara says there are th- only three things in the world that are, that are stated between two names of Hashem. There are three times in the Torah that Hashem's name is mentioned, another concept is mentioned, then Hashem's name is mentioned. Three things. There are three things in the Torah that are sandwiched between what the Gemara calls two oisios. Two, before Hashem discussed, does it mean two words, or does it mean two signs? But what it really means is two names of Hashem. Kael Deus Hashem, that means Kael, Hashem's name of kindness, is a God of knowledge, of wisdom, Deot, Hashem. Kael Nekamois Hashem. Hashem is a God of vengeance, Nekama. Same, ex- exact same expression. Kael, Deus Hashem. Kael, Nekamois Hashem. Exactly. And a third one, which is the Beis HaMikdash, which incidentally was the result of Purim. The beginning, the sowing the seeds of the permission to go back and build the Beis HaMikdash, also inherited in Purim. But I'm not going to speak about that now. Because it says... Hashem, Koenen Yodecha, Hashem, it says that by, by the Beis HaMikdash, right? It says the same idea that Mikdash Hashem, Koenen Yodecha, Hashem, Mikdash Hashem, Hashem's name is put on both sides of the word Mikdash, which means that, what does this mean? It means that Hashem can be manifest in the world, the truth can be manifest in the world, in there are three things that can do that. They can take a name of Hashem and bond it to a different manifestation of Hashem without going into the details. There are three things that can do that. can move a full gilu in the world. One is the Mikdash, the base of Mikdash. The simple understanding of that is that's the place where Hashem is revealed. You go to the temple, that's where the voice speaks. Now that's where Hashem manifests. But let's think about the other two for a moment. There are two ex- parallel expressions in Torah. Kael Deus Hashem, Kael Nekamus Hashem. It means like this. The word Kael... Hashem's name, Aleph and Alamet, is Chesed Kel Kol Ayim. It's the middle, Hashem's middle of Chesed, the beginning of all things, Oilam Chesed Yibone. And from there you move into a full Gilui of Yud Kei Vav Kei. Exactly that Gilui in the world that Amalek, which is the Purim enemy, tries to block. How can you reveal Hashem's name in the world? How do you reveal that full name that Amalek is blocking in the world? How do you go from the Kel, the beginning of Hashem's revelation in the world, to the full revelation of Yud Kei Vav Kei? There are two ways you can do it. Either Deus, you have wisdom, Das. Or Nakama. What does this mean? Das means deep understanding of the truth in the world. Das means a connection to the truth. You know that in Hebrew the word Das means wisdom and it means intimate bonding, right? Male female bonding, a marital bond is called Das. Knowledge, that sort of knowledge means where the knower and the known become one. Right? And that's called Das. That is the true understanding of wisdom and the Gomorrah goes into extreme statements about Das. The Gemara, for example, says a person who has this kind of das has everything. The da'be kulabe, a person who has das has everything. The lo da'be ma, the person who doesn't have das has nothing. Another place, the Gemara says that a person, yeah, a person who has das has acquired everything. A person who has no das has acquired nothing. The Gemara elsewhere says that a person who has no das asul rachem alav. The Gemara Sanhedrin says a person who has no das it's forbidden to to be kind to such a person. You can't even show a person kindness. A person has no wisdom. Get no in English. The the beginning of this is called common sense. 
but it's a much deeper thing than common sense. But a person has no common sense and uh, you're not even allowed to be kind to such a person. The reason is because kindness, <coughs> when, you, when you give such a person something, he'd only damage, he does, when, a, when an addict comes to your door to give him money, is cruelty. When an addict comes to your door and you give him, you give him money, you think you've been kind to him. He's going to use that to harm himself worse. A person has no dice, he's going to bend everything into its wrong use. Anything you give him is going to harm him more. When an addict comes to your door asking money, give him a sandwich. Usually he won't take the sandwich, by the way. Usually he won't take the sandwich, it's not what he wants. But you can't do that. Asal rachem alav. Rav Moshe once said, can you imagine how much rachem such a person needs? Imagine a person that you're not even allowed to show kindness to. You imagine how much kindness that person really needs. A person who has da'as has everything, right? Da'as means a connection with Hashem. Da'as Torah is a manifestation of this. Da'as means a, a, a shining of wisdom, of revelation in the world that shows the truth in the world. And a person who builds that wisdom, a person who has that kind of da'as has everything, like the Moshe says. Da'as be kula be. That is, the, that is the ultimate. And learning Torah, of course, is the clarification of that dice. It is taking, in facts, assembling them correctly, perceiving their connection, perceiving the underlying truth. Dice means connecting with the wisdom. It isn't only knowing a fact. Machines also know facts and they can print out their answers. But they don't connect with them. The, the real wisdom is that you connect. That dice is such a deep faculty of knowledge that the Mephoshim talk about it say that if there's something you know with the dice that turns out to be false, you don't not know it anymore. You cease to exist. The things you know with the dice are what you are, for example. For example, the primary thing you know with your dice is that you exist. You don't know you exist through any proofs. If you have to start establishing proofs that you exist, you're in big trouble. If you have to start going through a philosophical discussion to why we really exist, you're in big trouble. It's like the professor told the philosophy class that there's no proof that you exist. There's no proof in philosophy. There's no formal proof that you exist. One student got very distressed. And a week later, he ran up to the professor and said, Professor, tell me, do I exist? The professor said to him, who wishes to know? <laughs> the answer is, das is not something you can establish philosophically. It's something that you know. Imagine, imagine a fact leaves your mind. Imagine something that you know, a fact. You think something's in a certain place and it turns out not to be true. You don't disappear. The fact disappears. But if you know something with das, for example, you know your own existence, and that fact disappears, of course you disappear. That's who you are. That's who you are. Right? Your knowledge of self, the deepest kinds of knowledge are the things where the knowledge is part of you. It's not an external fact that you register. It is the mind itself. The knower and the known are one. That's the marital intimacy of you and your knowledge. The two have become one. The, the mind that knows is the things that it knows. That is genuine wisdom in the world. And therefore, Das is the way to bring Hashem's manifestation into the world. But there's another way. There's another way. Kel Deus Hashem. Kel Nekamas Hashem. Nakama means that you can establish this truth in an entirely different fashion. How? Like we began. Either you can establish the truth by, by constructing it and seeing it clearly, or you can take all possible alternatives and destroy them. When you destroy the alternatives, you, all you leave is the truth. Again, the, two, the way you can put this in formal terms in mathematics, there are two ways of proving something. In mathematics, there are two kinds of proofs. There's a proof called the proof by derivation, where you build up a thing from first principles till you establish it, and there's a thing called proof by exclusion. A or B must be true. I cannot prove A, but I can disprove B. If you can thoroughly disprove B, you have rigorously proved A. Those are the two methods you can use in logic, right? in, in mathematical logic. This is, yeah, this is parallel to what Rob Soda calls, like we began in the beginning, achpaya and ahafcha. Right? Achpaya means to squash the falsehood down. Achpaya means to turn it into the truth. There are two methods you can establish the truth. One is called das. You can build the truth and establish it and understand it. That's one method. The other method is take all the alternatives and destroy them. But destroy them in such a way that the truth comes out of them. In their being destroyed, you see the truth revealed. Right? This is exactly, and it's always like that. When Yaakov battles Esau, he has to use his tools against him. That's the, why does Esau pretend, why does Yaakov pretend to be Esau? Why does, why does he use deception? So Rav Desla explains, because Esau's tool is deception. Yaakov can only defeat him using his own tool. When he's defeated using his own tool, the truth is completely revealed. It's not that you push aside the evil, then there's space for the good to be revealed. The pushing aside of the evil must be the revelation of truth. That's the way it must be. That's, that's called nakama. The spiritual use of nakama means, nakama is not din. Din means that the, the, the recompense is given. The, the evil are punished. Nakama means that the evil turn out to reveal that they punish themselves. That the destruction of the evil... It, when Haman prepares a noose for Mordechai, everything that Haman is doing is preparing his own destruction. When it happens, it's a very clear... It's not that some 
shining knight in white armor rode in from left field and destroyed Haman and things. It's not like that. It turns out that what he does is... That's called Nekama. Nekama is when the whole situation turns itself on its head and all the things that have been the dangers and all the problems turn out to be the solution. There's no more elegant revealing. And you have two options. Either you can build the dais, no Torah, no the truth in the world, or you can build Nekama where you attack the evil and destroy it in such a way it reveals the truth. On Purim, you don't need dais because Nekama is what's happening. The reason you can drink on Purim till there's no dais left is because this is the day when Nekama is. On the one day of the year, where the evil self-destructs with such perfect counterpoised, such perfect counterpoise, where each element of evil turns out to be its own destruction and reveals the truth. This is the one day you other days you don't, yeah, you know, we don't the world unfortunately doesn't reveal that. And therefore we need very deep dyes. We need the kind of dyes that can perceive the truth in a very murky world. But on the one day a year, that is the premonition of the final hippoch, the final re- reversal, the final turnaround in history, as Afik. Al Amrim Safa Bro. Then when Hashem says, I will the one day that's the premonition of that final reversal where the evil build their own destruction. On that day you can drink until you're mindless. Because you don't need understanding on this day. On this day you'd have to be blind not to see it. Where every step that spells our destruction spells our salvation and their destruction. Right? And therefore, therefore on the day of Purim, which is a day of ultimate Nakama, Kale Nakama Hashem, the Kale Deus Hashem can be relaxed. That's the that's the secret. Let's look at one final manifestation of Hippoch. Again, wherever you look in Torah, you'll see the same theme through and through. I don't know if the Ramchal makes it very clear. But let's just take one final, one final expression for, for today. This experience of a thing reversing itself is what we call laughter. What we call tzchik. And the Torah is full of laughter too. It's full of nekama, setting to rights by the thing turning itself around. It's full of Hippoch as Ayafeich al-Amim. And it's full of laughter. Yeshe Bashamayim Yisrak. Hashem who sits in heaven and watches the whole process is laughing. What does that mean? As Yamala Yisrak Pinu. Then our mouth will be full of laughter. Right? You know, there's a halacha the Gemara says you're not allowed to have your mouth full of laughter now in this world. It's inappropriate. There's a lot of suffering going on. You should laugh. You have to laugh. You have to know how to laugh even in, even in suffering in times of difficulty. But not fully. It's insensitive to have a mouth full of laughter when there's tragedy. But as Yamala Yisrak Pinu. Then our mouth will be full of laughter. Right? It doesn't just mean we'll laugh because things will be good. Laughter is a very special thing. Laughter is always the response to hippoch. When the thing goes in one direction and it turns itself in the other direction, right? And, um, and what looked like destruction turns out to be salvation. That's called hippoch. And the response to hippoch, the appropriate human response to seeing justice done, where it looked to see a, re- a redemption and a revelation occur in the least possible circumstances. And when you realize that all the destruction, all the negativity was building all the positivity, that there's nothing funnier than that. Tzchayk always means, there's no time to go into it fully now, but the, 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 the Torah has applies tzchayk to a number of things. Immorality is called tzchayk. Immorality is called tzchayk. It says when Yishmael was trying to attack, attacking, yeah, Yishmael's attack on, on his counterpart, right, in that generation of history, when he's counterpoised with Yitzchak. So it says that he's doing a number of mitzachek. And mitzachek means immorality. You found it a few times in Torah. It means idolatry, which is the exact opposite of the true true focus in the world. And it means, right, it means always tzachek is, is a manifestation in Torah of a, a thing that is moving in one direction when it's suddenly... What is laughter? What is laughter? Laughter is a human response to a situation that goes in one direction and suddenly, or looks like one thing and turns, suddenly turns out to be the opposite. The greater the contrast, the, least, the less expected, and, and, and the, yeah, the sharper the contrast and the less expected it is, the funnier it is. No, laughter is a very strange thing. A very strange thing. First of all, only humans can laugh. It's uniquely human. Secondly, you can only laugh at something that's human. You can only laugh at something that's human. There's nothing a tree can do that's funny. Unless it looks like a person, then it's very funny. Only, hu- only something human can make you laugh. It's a remarkable thing. Nothing can generate humor unless it's a human element. When one person looks like a different person, that could be funny. When an animal looks like a person, it might be funny. When a person looks like an animal, it n- never might be funny. But uh, only humans can laugh and only act things that are a distortion of the human. It's a remarkable thing, that. And what makes humans laugh, is when it's, and what's remarkable about this, is even when what's happening is not funny at all. When a person's going through a very embarrassing reversal, Right? There's a person who, who's at the height of his conceit, slips on a banana peel, and falls flat on his back. It's ridiculous. I mean, who would laugh at a thing like that? 
But even as you run to help him up, you can't hide a smile because it's so... When, when, when a thing reverses itself, even when the person who's the victim of the transformation is not enjoying it one bit, it's very... What is that? What does that mean? And the answer is that laughter is exactly the human expression of joy, tremendous joy, when a thing reveals its exact opposite in the least possible fashion. What great expression do you have of this? Vatischak le yom acharon. Here's a woman of greatness, laughs at the day of death. Vatischak le yom acharon. Is a woman of greatness, laughs at the day of death. What does that mean? What it means is a person who deep enough understanding knows that what looks like an ultimate end, death, disintegration, decomposition, complete destruction, is the beginning of a life that makes this one pale into insignificance. That's very funny. It's not funny when you're going through it. Make no mistake. But for a person who understands that, why is it a woman who laughs? So the Rambam explains. The Rambam says because a woman goes through that in her body. When a woman's giving birth, she's giving birth, right? So it looks like two people are dying. I mean, I don't mean to put you off, ladies. It's a big, a big mitzvah. But it looks like two people are dying. A woman in labor looks like she's dying. And if you know what's happening to the child, the child is going through a certain death. The Gesher Chaim explains this very clearly. A child has dozens of features of his body that make him survive inside the mother, underwater, without breathing air. Any of those features would kill him if he was born into the world. And any of the features that you need to keep you alive, if you gave it to an unborn child, you'd kill him. It's a complete reversal. He has holes in his heart, the child, the blood's flowing in the wrong direction. He has no lungs. An unborn child has two little scrunched up bits of tissue. There's no blood going there. All the blood that goes to the lungs in the fetus goes in the opposite direction through a major blood vessel, takes it away. He's got blood vessels coming out through his liver. He's got a different kind of blood. He's got dozens of reasons that are perfect for his survival. But if you gave him any of those, when he's born, you'd kill him. And what happens? His birth begins. The Degesh Chaim says, if there was a twin left behind in the womb, he begins to mourn. Because the child for sure is going to die. And I can tell you as a doctor, you hold the newborn child, I have had to deliver dozens of babies in my career. And each time you do it, you stand there and you, and you hold this little child in your hands and he starts to die. He goes deep blue, then he goes purple, makes these gasping movements. Of course he's going to die. He's got holes in his heart. He's bleeding through his umbilicus, this pumping out blood. To, yeah, three, four minutes from now, for sure he's going to be dead. He's got ten different reasons why he's going to die. And suddenly they all reverse. Talk about hippo. This umbilical cord that he's pumping out blood furiously clamps down like an iron cable. Stops the bleeding. At the same moment, the holes in the heart close. The blood vessel taking all the blood away from the lungs closes down and hits the lungs. The same moment the blood hits the lungs, they pop open. At the same moment, he takes his first breath. And four minutes later, all the things have reversed and he's doing fine in the world. Now the Gemara puts it. The Gemara says, when a child is born, what's closed opens and what's open closes. One sentence. The Gemara needed a flamet, lamet, 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 The Gemara says, when a child is born, what's closed opens and what's open closes. Talk about hippoch. The re- yeah. And therefore, and therefore, the child is going through a reversal where it looks like guaranteed destruction. There's plenty of reasons why he's not going to be able to survive in that world. And beyond the transition, beyond what that remaining twin can see, all these things reverse and become reasons for life. And that becomes his survival in the world. Talk about a hippo. And that's where life only begins. And therefore a woman who's been through that, a woman who in her flesh has been there, she's felt the experience what feels like she's dying. And if she knows what's happening to the child inside, she knows this child's going through it. There's no hope for the child. And those very pains are the ones that bring the child into the world. And those very reversals are what keep him alive in the world. That's very funny. That's very, that's spiritually, a woman can laugh at that. And we sing that on Friday night, by the way, because it's when the week becomes the Shabbos, that, 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 uh, that, that, that presaging experience of, of a redemption, when, when the, the, the mundane week of history will become the Shabbos of Mashiach. So at that transition, right, we say Vatishak, then a woman who's been through this and delivered a child in what looks like a guaranteed death and turns out to be the reason for life, that is called that's called a hippoch that will happen at the end of time. And therefore, we, that's what we say on Friday night, but Tishchak Leyem Acharon, she's the one who can laugh at that experience. And of course, we don't have much time, but you, you realize immediately that's why we are called laughter. The first Jewish child born is called Yitzchak. Yitzchak means the one who will laugh. That's what it means. Right? He's the first Jewish child born. Avram Avinu wasn't born as a Jew. Now, Futner says he was the, the Eshter Gevorana, and Yitzchak is the Eshter Gevorana, the first born, the first child born as a Jew is Yitzchak. And he's, how, how's he born? He's born when it's impossible to be born. He's impossible. His parents are too old. There's no way they can have children. 
And at that moment of impossibility, Hashem arrives and says, you're going to have... Of course they laughed. That's the appropriate response to an impossible transition. And when he's born, of course they call him laughter. He's impossible. And what happens when he grows up and becomes of marriageable age? Hashem says, kill him. This is some comedy, you understand. Hashem says, kill him. So his father takes him and he stretches his neck. And Hashem says, kill him. Hashem, you told me this will be the the father of a great nation. Hashem says, yeah, that's true, but kill him anyway. Hashem, there's no way you could want this. Hashem says, right, I don't want it. Kill him anyway. Talk about impossibility. And what happens? So Chumash says, he, at the last moment, he didn't kill him. The Zohar says, he killed him. The Zohar says, he died. The Zohar says, Ephra shall Yitzchak munach the ashes of Yitzchak remained on the altar. So Yitzchak gets up and he goes off to get married. Meantime, he's being killed. What, what is that? Is that impossible? Absolutely. We begin where the impossible ends. That's called Tchiyas HaMesim. Tchiyas HaMesim doesn't mean that the dead live. Tchiyas HaMesim means that death becomes life. Tchiyas HaMesim doesn't mean the dead get up and carry on. Tchiyas HaMesim means that the death itself is a revelation of life itself. And Yitzchak goes off to get married, having been destroyed. It means he lives in this world with his head in another world. He walks this earth as a physical being, and yet his spiritual being occupies another plane. The Tikkun Zohar says Yitzchak spells Ketz Chai, death in life, redemption in exile, the next world in this one. He lives in the next world. And because he goes through that impossible experience of being killed while he's alive and living in two worlds at once, that's why we are who we are. That's why we're still here. We begin where the impossible ends. We begin where despair ends, where things become impossible and hopeless. That's where we, that's where, that's where we begin. Not, that, in a very deep way, is very funny. It's not funny. Yitzchak means the last, last laugh, of course. And wherever you look in history, you see the same thing. Yosheh Bashamayim Yitzchak is always like that. Haman is building a noose for Mordechai, and the Medrash says he put his head in it to make sure it fitted. And the angel Gavriel came down and said, suits you. Suits you. Paroi, pharaohs, issue a d- decree of destruction against whoever child is going to be born, right? Because he knows a, new, a newborn child is going to be the redeemer. So he makes a decree to destroy every child, including Egyptians. And on his knee, he's raising the one that he's looking to destroy. It's very funny. Not funny when you're going through it, but Yeshua Bashamai Misra. In that original exile when the brothers stood in front of Joseph and all hope was lost. That original premonition of the exile of the Jewish people in Egypt, which is the father or mother of all exiles. They stand in front of Joseph, this strange tormentor, driving them crazy, one destruction after another, until finally there's no hope left. And at that moment, Yehuda steps forward and he says, look, we're guilty, but why all this is happening, I have no idea. And the last statement he makes is, take me. I promised my father I'd bring him home, take me. Because there was no option. Swas Emma says they could have either gone back to Canaan and killed Yaakov, as soon as he would see that Binyamin wasn't there, he would have died. Or they could become mass murderers and wipe out everybody. There were no options. At that moment, Yehuda steps forward and he says, take me. And in that moment of impossibility, after 22 years of agony, they hear the words, Ani Yosef. At the moment of greatest impossibility, from where? The source of the problem. The source of the torment. Because, talk about Hippuch. Of course, they weren't laughing. They weren't laughing. They were paralyzed. They couldn't move. Because when you're going through it, it's not funny. But afterwards, when you understand that all the torment we went through was the reason th- that we hear, that every step that he put us through, the, less, the least sensible ones, the most perverted, the, most, the weirdest, the most torturous things we went through, were the reasons that we correct, self-corrected, you relish those events. You wouldn't give up a moment to that. Right? And therefore, that is the final. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the hippoch where the mask comes off, where the destructive elements in the world turn around and reveal their own Kedusha, their own, their meaning, right? Where an eye for an eye becomes an exact process, an exact process where all the destructive elements in the world reveal themselves to be the, the source of redemption, right? When finally the source of the problem, the source of the greatest torment and fear, the source of guaranteed destruction becomes Ani Yosef. Now, that is a very, very funny experience in terms of the last laugh. And that is what Purim, that's the beginning of the theme of Purim of Hippoch. And the Hippoch of Purim who we are looking to extend into its final manifestation as Efechal Amim Safar Brura Likre Kulam Beshe Mashe.